Hello, thank you for joining me for another edition of True Conversion. We've been going through in the past video, past few videos, uh, some some ways that when we're truly converted, how basically how we can be used of God to bear fruit for especially for those around us that are lost. And last time we were finishing up talking about blindness, the blindness of their hearts, and that God wants to call them out of darkness and and off of, from uh, the scales that are blinding them, which is another form of darkness. Lastly, I would like to talk about how the Holy Spirit, how we can ask him to work in their lives. And there's so much scripture that will assist us on this journey. One that we're all very familiar with, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we ask the Holy Spirit to bring them to belief in him so that they will not perish. Now in Luke 10, it says, Therefore, talking about Jesus, said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. Well, Jesus is saying we're supposed to ask God to thrust. I think in one, uh, one translation it, it says thrust labors into the harvest field. So we need to pray not only for God to send out labors, but we, ask, we also need to ask God to make us, equip us to be laborers. Sometimes, you know, there's people that we pray for and we already know we've tried and they they don't want to hear it from us for one reason or another. But then pray for God to surround them with other people that they will listen to. Other people that have influence in their lives. You know, you can pray for someone at the, you know, far, far away, another country even, that God can send laborers. God knows those who are his own. And he knows who will be the perfect person to speak truth into that person's life. Let me back up to John 3.16 because the one point I wanted to make, I completely just ran past it. But I I thank God. I, I use this scripture to remind myself not to take the great salvation that Jesus got for us on the cross. He obtained it for us on the cross. Not to take that for granted. We hear it preached so much and we we those of us that have been saved for a number of years, we can get to a place where we don't even think about it. We take it for granted. So I try to use this scripture as a reminder to thank God for sending Jesus, for sending him for me, for sending him for this loved one that I'm praying for, this lost loved one. I say, God, thank you that you sent Jesus to die for him. And it just brings it down to a personal level of where Jesus came for that person you're praying for. Jesus came and died for them. Moving on, Isaiah 11. This is another thing I pray for the lost. And like I said in the previous video, just because th these are just things I found helpful. God can show you what is helpful for you, but I always like to pass along the things that God's shown me, because I know that it's not just for me, that he wants other people to know. So I'm just, I'm telling you some of the nuggets I've collected along the way. Um, Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I pray these, I pray for God to pour out his spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, in Psalm 910, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And in a Bible that I read, the man that put it together was, it's not really commentary, but he was a Hebrew and Greek scholar 
And he says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he said not to be confused. He said that it's the beginning of wisdom, but it's not to be confused with wisdom itself. In other words, just fearing the Lord, it's just the very tip, tip, top of wisdom. It's not the entire body of wisdom. It's the beginning of the journey. It's like saying taking one step is progress in you know a journey of a thousand miles or however that that saying goes but so you haven't completed the journey is what i'm saying when you take one step you haven't completed the journey and that's the point he was making here that the fear of the lord is just the very beginning of wisdom it's not the embodiment of it but it is a start and everyone has to start john 16 8 through 11 this is another thing I pray for the lost. And when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And so I will pray. I'll say, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to to come and to convict this person of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because what did I read today? That if we, yes, if we, if we allow God to judge our sin now and let him deal with us now, then we won't be condemned later. So when the Holy Spirit comes with conviction, and the word conviction actually means convincing, it's, it comes from the word convince. So when the Holy Spirit convinces someone of their sin, because it says they believe not on me, so that's a sin of unbelief, and it can be rebellion, but it starts off with they believe not. So to me, that says unbelief. And of righteousness, if the Holy Spirit comes to convict or to convince of righteousness, he says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. That we need to be right with God by the Holy Spirit. And because Jesus isn't physically present anymore. And he comes to convince of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So when the Holy Spirit conv convinces someone of judgment, I think that can have a couple different layers to it that he's coming to convince them that they have sinned and that sin will be judged. And, you know, if we judge our own sin, then God, I believe, cast it. That's where it talks about. He takes your sin and cast it as far as the East is from the West. I only believe that happens when we agree with him to confess means to agree, to say the same thing. So when, when we come to God and confess our sin, and we judge our own sin and we say, God, just like the prodigal son we talked about last time, you know, he said, I've sinned against heaven and against my father. He judged his own sin. He agreed with God. They were saying the same thing, that what he was doing was sin. And that's what the Holy Spirit, when he comes convincing of judgment, he's saying that, you know, your sin will be judged. And I'm not saying this, this is completely it. But I think part of it is he's saying that there's judgment. The devil, it says the prince of this world is judged. So he will be judged and condemned. If you remember what happens at the end of the story in Revelation. So when the Holy Spirit comes to convince or to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that's what we want. We want lost people to understand this is real. This is real. There is sin. You've missed it. You've missed, you, you've sinned, so you've missed righteousness. So you need to get right with God. There's sin, deal with that. Righteousness, get that. And there's judgment, judge your sin, and you won't be condemned with the, with the prince of this world. Hope I made that clear. <laughs> All right, John 14, 26. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Wow. 
I mean, Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. And what I ask him to do where it's concerning lost loved ones, I ask him to remember, it says he, he, he will teach them. Think about the prodigal son again. In that parable, he was, in that story, he was um, taught through his circumstances. Now, not everybody has to be beat over the head with, it has to be just completely horrible before they'll bend the knee, but there's some people that they have to wind up on their face in a pig pen before they will give it up to God. We just, I just pray, whatever it takes, God knows the person's breaking point <clears throat> where they, where they, they break with their self and they say, God, I, I want to serve you, not self. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit, think about the prodigal son. He, he was being taught that this isn't the way to live. And then things were brought to his remembrance. He said, oh, I've sinned against heaven and against my father. I, and my father's got provision and I'm here starving. This, he, he became wise. He said, wow, I'm looking around and I've been a fool. And I'm not going to be a fool anymore. I want to be wise. Remember the uh, fear of the Lord? is the beginning of wisdom. So he was fearing God. He said, I've sinned against God. And he got a little wisdom. And he said, wow, I've been a fool. And I'm, I don't have to be a fool one second longer. I'm turning around. I'm repenting. Remember, repenting means you were heading one direction and you turn around and you head the opposite. And you turn your back on your former way of living. And that's exactly what he did. And the Holy Spirit taught him that in that pig pen. And then it says in John 14, 26, he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You know what I do? I pray. I got this idea one day. I pray that God will bring any scripture that this person I'm praying for, any scripture they've ever encountered, ever. Because we live in the land of, we have... The word of God is everywhere. We, people have several Bibles just in one home. But yet there's a famine of the word of God in our land because it's not taken up residence in the hearts of people. What I'm saying, though, is because we live in this land where the word of God has been preached all over the place, there's been people that have gone to church and they've heard salvation preached every Sunday and they go away unchanged or they've read the Bible, or they've heard preaching on television, or on the internet, or on the radio, whatever, um, on TV. Um, but I'll ask God to take that little seed, that little seed, because his word is his seed. It says, um, I don't know where this is at. I don't know if I have it in my lineup here. But is God says that you know his word does not return to him void. But it accomplished what he, what he um, purposes and achieves the, or it, it, what he, okay, it accomplishes what he desires and achieves the purpose for which he sent it. So if his word is a seed and that little seed has been laying dormant, has not, has not germinated. It's, remember we talked about the, the conditions of the heart in Mark 4 about, you know, some seed was on the wayside and some seed was in thorny ground. Some seed was in rocky ground and some seed was in good soil. Okay, well, if we're praying all of these things that we've been talking about in these, in these videos, if we're praying all these things for the lost so that they can truly be converted, we're praying that the condition of their heart, that the rocks are being removed, that the thorns that are taking up the soil, they're being weeded out, that the wayside's being plowed up and the, the fallow ground is being broken up. Okay, if we're praying for the condition of their heart, the soil for that seed to change, then we can ask God to bring those things, that little seed, bring that to their remembrance. And the Holy Spirit can breathe life into that little seed. You know, uh, Paul, I believe, said, one plants, another waters, but it's God who gives the increase. So you can ask God, you, you, you know, maybe you've spoken the word to this person and they've turned away from you. 
but that's okay. God can send someone else to water. We talked about the labors. God can send someone else to water that seed and God can still bring the increase. God can find a way. You know, we don't know all the infinite possibilities of the way that God can bring uh, the, the, a verse of scripture, you know, in the, I believe in the Hebrew, it's called a rhema word, a, a word that's full of life to this person. And let me put this in, into your experience. Have you ever been reading the Bible? And it's, uh, you know, a scripture you've read many times before, but you read it this time and it seemed like it just jumped off the page, like the thing lit up in neon. And you're like, oh my goodness, I've never seen this before. This applies directly to what I've been praying about to my situation. And you go, wow, that was amazing. That's what I'm talking about. God can do that with people in darkness. As you're praying, the, these forces of darkness have to back off, that the, the scales are coming off. The darkness is turning into light. A light has shined in the darkness. When you're doing this, the Holy Spirit can bring scripture to, to mind, to life. Remember when in the book of Acts, when... Um, you know, Jesus said, uh, you know, I may be wrong here, but let me just go for this. You know, when he said there may come a day, there come a day when you'll be brought before the rulers who are persecuting you and, um, you know, the Holy Spirit will bring things to your mind or he will tell you what to say. Maybe I've got those confused, but I just know the Holy Spirit can bring light. He can take that little seed that has been, it could have lain dormant for 50 years. I've heard of stories where, you know, this one woman, she was in her seventies and she prayed for her. She'd prayed for her husband all of their married life. I think she might've come as a, a new believer into the marriage. And she was just crying out to God for him. And, and I don't even know what time period this is in. I want to say it was at least a hundred years ago, but he happened to be going down some country road. And I don't know if he was on horseback or walking or what, but there was a church service. And I think they were having just a time of uh, like a solemn quiet before God, just waiting on God. And he walked in and the Holy Spirit, I know this isn't a verse, but I don't know that that wasn't happening, but he walked into that church and the conviction of God fell on him and he cried out to God in the middle of that church for forgiveness. He was repentant and he came to the Lord in his 70s and his wife had been praying for decades and God was able to just bring, bring the word to life because I imagine this woman had probably spoken to him some gospel truth in all those years. Anyway, I, I just, I look at things like that and I'm like, God can do, you know, he can do things. What does this say in Ephesians? Exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. A lot of times people leave off that last little bit according to the power that works in us. But see, this is just what I'm talking about in these scriptures. If we let the power that works in us, God will do it according to what the power that he can flow through us unhindered, you know, kind of like a pipe. Like if, if we're a clogged up pipe, have you ever had that happen where you have a sink and it's not draining very well and you're like, uh, it's taking forever for this to drain. But then you go clean that pipe out and it's like, wow, it's brand new. It's bam and it's done. Well, when we become vessels like that, that the Holy Spirit can flow through unhindered, then God says he will do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that dwells in us. According to the unhindered flow of the Holy Spirit that he's allowed when we get the junk out of our hearts. All right. Hebrews 3.13. I thought this, this one came... I know God was confirming just a few days ago. I read it and then I heard it online. I heard someone talking about it. And I think I even heard it a third time, possibly that same day or maybe the next. But so it's, it's worth uh, mentioning. Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another daily 
while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, and he's talking about believers that are encouraging, exhorting each other, raising each other to the standard of godliness. And he's saying today, you know, we have to include that. The Holy Spirit included that because so often we procrastinate things. We kick the can down the road and we think, oh, I'll get to that tomorrow. But God's saying this is, this is, this is his priority, that this is something he doesn't want you putting off. This is, he said, while it is called today. You know, no one is promised tomorrow. So when we are called to exhort one another daily, he's saying daily and while it's called today. So I think he's trying to get the point across that this is, this is very important. And why is it important? Well, the second part of that scripture, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, if we go... If we go on and on and on without exhorting one another, without bringing each other up to the godly standard that God has in his word, it, our heart is going to be hardened. Remember that the wayside, the hardened soil? Remember the seed can't penetrate? Just remember that we need the word, not just, I mean, conversion. Yes, we got to get this whole, this whole show going. We've got to start somewhere. But the word of God has got to have constant entry into our hearts. We've got to be open to the word of God because it corrects us and it teaches us and it, it keeps us from getting into worldly things, getting entangled again, like we talked about um, in a previous video. But he wants us to prevent getting hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So sin, missing God's mark, transgressing God's law, uh, being having iniquity reign in our hearts is so deceitful. You know, I think in Jeremiah it said, the heart is deceitful and wicked, desperately wicked. Who can trust the heart? That's a loose translation, but our, our own hearts, if we get away from the word of God, then our own hearts can deceive us our own hearts because they get hardened. All right. Romans 8 verses 26 through 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. It's because we, we, we deceive ourselves thinking we're wise, but we got to have total, constant, and complete dependence on the Holy Spirit. It says, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God's got us. He's got our, our back here. God's teaching us. He's helping our infirmities. The word infirmity usually means, I know I looked it up in another instance. I'm not, I haven't honestly looked this one up, but what I understand what infirmities are is the inability to produce results. So in the Holy Spirit, he will help us with our inability to produce results. Have you been praying for someone for years and years and years, and it doesn't look like they're any closer to being converted than the day you started, and you're like, uh, I'm kind of getting weary and doing good here, Lord. And God's got the Holy Spirit ready and willing to help us in our inability to <laughs> produce results because you know what it isn't us that produces the results it's the holy spirit so we've got to stay in constant communication with him and he makes intercession for us he helps us to know how to pray when we don't know how and he searches our, the hearts and knows the mind of the spirit and he makes it says at the last in the last verse there because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of god He's got us surrounded. He's, he is a constant help. He, he is the one who can come alongside of us and, and take our hand and, and move us in the right direction and give us the power to go on. Uh, we just have to avail ourselves of his help. I'm moving quickly here because I see that I'm out of time already, but I wanted to wrap this up. 
I'm going to read you a couple things that might encourage you as you try, as you, as you not try, but as you walk along with the Lord in this area of bearing fruit, especially in the area of praying for the lost. Just remember this Proverbs 1130 says the fruit of the righteous, the fruit of the righteous. That's what we've been talking about. Having fruit as a righteous person is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. A tree of life. We could go all kinds of directions there. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. And we are partakers of that tree of life, of, of God's life. And it says, and he that winneth souls is wise. All right. John 14, 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. You asking God to save, to bring someone to salvation, because it's the Father that draws them. This, you know, It's God that draws someone to him. It's not us arguing. Nobody argue, can argue anyone into the kingdom of God. They have to be drawn by the Spirit. He says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So we are... He says we're wise if we if we try to con to win souls, and then we are glorifying the Father in the Son. I wrote a little little summary here. And bearing fruit includes prayer, worship, obedience, winning souls, basically letting Jesus through His Holy Spirit live His life through you, in bringing the Father's will to pass, bringing glory to God, and building the kingdom. That's what we're talking about. And I'll leave you with one, one more scripture. 1 Peter 4, 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope these teachings have helped you maybe get a little bit um, energized and inspired to to bear fruit for the kingdom and to go after the lost in your circle of influence. Until next time, thank you and God bless.